And now, a special Monday Prism. Before looking through this prism, you probably should take a deep breath. More than ever, we are discovering that this is the age of science fiction. Six months ago, I spoke to Harvard's Utkan de Marici about a 3D printer he has developed that uses stem cells to create viable structures. Now, in just a few blinks of the eye, scientists have for the first time developed, though not using a 3D printer, a lung to look into a breakthrough that may change the availability and possibility of organ transplant. We are being joined by one of the scientists behind the breakthrough, Dr. Julie Nichols. She's the Associate Director of Research and Operations at the Galveston National Laboratory. She's also a Associate Professor in the Departments of Internal Medicine, Microbiology, and Immunology. Welcome, Dr. Nichols. Thank you. Although you're using some of the techniques we become familiar with when we're talking about pluripotent stem cells in terms of scaffolding or lattices, this isn't actually a stem cell story. Can you tell me how this lung was made? Okay. Well, before you, before you go to um, you know, letting go of the stem cell uh, topic totally, you need to understand that the most simple experiment is always the one you need to start with, the most logical one. And so for us, the idea was to take cells that were already lung cells or mixtures of lung cells that were adult or maybe even some of them might be stem cells, but to take a lung that uh, was a discarded lung that could not be used for transplantation because it was too damaged, um, to take it all apart and collect all the cells that we could that were alive and use that as a cell source to build another lung. And so... The first part of it is collecting the cells and having them available, but the second part of this is also taking a second lung, in this case a pediatric lung, again discarded because it was was much too damaged. Um, It had been some traumatic event that led to the death of the child, and so we took the, the lung that couldn't be used for any other purpose, and rather than throwing it away, we removed all of the cells from that lung, and then took the cells that we had isolated from the first lung and put them into the second lung. And so the the lung that we removed the cells from that we use as a scaffold material is really just the skeleton of a lung. It's the proteins that our our cells in our body make that they attach to and live within the basic structures of our body that we used as a skeleton or scaffold to put all the cells back into. And so this is the simplest way to go, the most logical thing to try. Can we take cells and reconstitute a lung just using adult cell types? When we're putting the lung cells onto the material, onto the scaffold, onto the architecture of the other lung or the remnants of the other lung, is there any risk of rejection? Is there any risk that this won't work just because the two lungs are incompatible? Well, when you remove all the cells and you use, for the one that's just structure, there are no cells left. And so our reactions from our, our body are to the cells that are expressing somebody's tissue type. And so by removing everything that should be present, any of the cell types that would be present, you have a very blank scaffold of just basic proteins and collagen is pretty much human collagen is human collagen. Your body doesn't necessarily react to it as long as it's perfectly clean. Now here comes the issue of putting somebody's cells back onto it. Those cells we were going to use the engineered lung as a transplant would have to match somebody's tissue type. And so although we've managed to make a lung, we're still faced with some of the same issues that you would face if you were going to get a donor lung from someone for a transplant for you. You'd still have to be as close as you can to tissue type, or you would have to make sure someone was severely immunosuppressed to be able to accept that. And so in this case, if we created a lung and it could be used for transplant, we'd have to be aware that the person would have to somewhat match the cells that we used as well as be immunosuppressed to receive a transplant, just like you would always need to, just like we have right now with normal, normal donations for transplantation. Of course, the other trick is not just making the lung, but making a lung that can breathe. How far are we along that line? Well, here's what we know about the lungs that we made, and we, and we made a few. We, we took a number, we did this on, on animal scaffolding first, because they're small, you don't need as many cells, so we started with rat, and then we moved up to, to rabbit size, and then we moved to human lobes that we worked with, and so this has been going on, this work has been going on for a few years, 
and actually the whole lungs that we created, the first one was a year ago, um, because we've been assessing what we produce. So what cells do we manage to keep? Do we have the cells that are involved in gas exchange? Do we actually produce vascular tissue or the blood vessels that should be there? Because our lung is, is an amazing structure that the actual air sacs or gas exchange happens when you breathe to let oxygen come in your body. Those air sacs are cupped as if you took your hand and kind of cupped around a little ball. The blood vessels cup around the cells in a way that lets you support gas exchange. And so in that kind of close contact, it's not enough to have the lung cells. You have to have the blood vessels that are there too. And so the what process that we've concentrated on as we developed this procedure was to produce the vasculature first and then come back in with the, with the lung cells so that they could develop side by side. Because this is not exactly like what happens in fetal development while all these structures grow up together, but the cells will attach to the the places they should normally attach to, there's something like a zip code recognition that, that directs the cells. So if you're a blood vessel cell, I want to attach in what used to be a blood vessel, the, the structures that were blood vessels, or if I'm going to be lung, I'm going to attach in those areas. And so that's basically how we're reconstituting this. So at least at the early stage right now, it does look like the cells are smart enough to not only figure out form, but also know what function they'll need to perform so that hopefully if this continues in the right direction in a few years, I understand we may be talking 10 or 12, we may begin to do animal transplantation and eventually human. And you're correct. And actually, and actually that's exactly the the way to have described it, except that our animal experiments, we hope to have it ready to do in the next year or so. Mm. Um, It wasn't enough to create a human lung on a human scaffold. We've also, alongside of that, been creating a pig lung and working to um, put cells back onto a pig lung in preparation for animal studies that would let, this, let us look at how this lung functions once it's put back into a living organism. And it, it's taken so long to get there because we would like our pig to survive the process of having this lung transplant and survive for a period of time so that we can learn as much as we can. I would like this pig to have a very nice life for, you know, to let it live as long as it can so we can assess what's happening with what we've created so we know what to do better for the future. Um, to, so eventually we can apply this to clinical applications for people. You're using lung cells right now, but do you see a point at which you may transition or also incorporate the use of either stem cells or pluripotent stem cells? Um, a lot of the research work that my team has done has been looking at other cell types. So we did some work very, oh, quite a while ago with uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, and we actually developed a lung on a rat scaffolding using mouse embryonic stem cells to grow mo- a lot of the tissue, a lot of the cell types and the tissues that you'd want to have in the lung. But the difference is, is that we haven't been studying human cells long enough, and, and mice are pretty much vermin, so their cells grew really well, but human stem cells don't always grow as well as, as some animal cell types do. And so in this case, we need to unlock a lot of the secrets that stem cells have. Pluripotent stem cells would be fabulous, um, induced pluripotent stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. There are a lot of possibilities for it, learning how to get them to to proliferate and expand more, as well as differentiate along lineages or, or into types of cells that you want them to be. But we're still having issues with that, that we don't do that really well yet. But we have time, you know. And so over time, we may understand more about these cell types, these stem cell types, that would let us use them more for applications such as this. But there's a lot to learn about them, too, because you don't want to develop a tissue that you'd use clinically that would be bad, could produce tumors. We really need to know how, the, how these stem cell types work better and how to get them to the point where they differentiate and then shut them off and keep them as a mature cell type and not have them do anything else. So in other words, even though we are living in the land of science fiction, we still have a little bit more venturing and questing to go. Oh, we always will. There's a lot left that in, in all of the fields that lead into what I'm doing in, in terms of development of, of engineered tissues, there's a lot that we need to know to get it to that end point, to do it better and safer, 
Um, and clinical application is always about doing things the best way you can with the least risk to a patient. And so that's the direction we're going to be going in. But this is a good start. I'm happy with a good start. We made, we made a good discovery. We did it simply and logically, and we learned so much from it. And so the next steps will, will you know, be there that we can just keep moving along as we try to develop this further. And, you know, Andrew, uh. this, is a, this is a continuum. The work that the scientist was doing on 3D printing uh-huh. Eventually, someday, maybe they'll be able to print an entire lung. He was talking about that, you know, or different various other organs. And, you know. And, and, and that, to me, if they can make a lung that has the same proteins that a lung does, the collagen and elastin to mm-hmm. give you strength and elasticity, if you can print that, you could print exactly what someone's lung looks like using CT scans and then produce a lung for them that would fit perfectly into their body, that surgeons could transplant easily because it matches them well. And so that would also, that would be a huge discovery to go along with the work that we're doing. Absolutely. And one of the things I love is how someone who's an immunologist now is relying on an engineer (laughs) who's relying. It's so multidisciplinary. And I think that is one of the keys to why this area is moving so well and so quickly. I think so, because, I mean, you're talking to me, but you need to understand that I I work with a cardiothoracic surgeon, a nanoparticle specialist, an engineer, two clinicians, one clinician who's my research partner and has been for the last 12 years, who is the card-carrying tissue engineer, who I met 12 years ago, and because he was doing a talk, and and he happened to mention engineering lung tissue, and I was like, oh, really? I wanted to do that. I'd like a model. And so... That's how we started working together, but it includes this large group of people as well as medical students and graduate students and high school students occasionally. And since this is cutting edge and nobody knows best, everybody's ideas are worth putting into the, you know, into the pie so that we know what to do in, in a next step. And, and everybody's involved in, in moving this ahead, and it takes